Thank you again for taking time to join us tonight. This is a very important topic, uh, something that the city doesn't take lightly, and we are delighted to have a moment to share information with you, uh, the facts and the research that we have done around this project. And we hope you find it informative and we hope we can address your questions tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sean Chambers, the Director of Water and Sewer for City of Greeley. Sean's been with the city for nearly three years, but has spent his entire career working in water utility management, utility infrastructure, water resource planning and policy, and natural resource economics. Sean's going to introduce our panelists tonight. So, Sean. Thank you, Kelly. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, this is the second of two public open houses. Um, we're excited to share with you a little bit more about the city's strategic efforts to secure water for Greeley's future. We're eager to share information about this project, address your questions, and ensure that the community receives accurate and accountable information. We know there are many proponents for the project and some opponents for the project. Our goal is to be transparent as possible and share data and research that we've been conducting. Tonight is about sharing information with the public and addressing your questions. With that, uh, I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, with us tonight uh, is the Water and Sewer Board Chairman, Harold Evans. Uh, Harold's been a Greeley resident since 1972. Harold's been a member of the Greeley Water and Sewer Board since 1997 and served as its chairman since 2003. Harold has an extensive background in water issues, including a bachelor's and master's degree in civil engineering from the University of Missouri. He also holds a license as a professional engineer in both Missouri and Colorado since 1990. The Greeley Water and Sewer Board uh, members are experienced policymakers in charge with a duty of guiding policy related to planning, acquisition, development, conveyance and protection of the water and sewer assets. Also with us tonight, Water and Sewer Department Chief Engineer, Adam Pryor. Adam's been with the city as its chief engineer for the past five years and manages a team of professional engineers performing design and construction project functions. Adam and his team lead projects related to Greeley's six water reservoirs, three treatment plants, more than 645 miles of water mains, 10 sewer lift stations, two water pump stations, and Adam is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Colorado. Also with us tonight is a member of our consulting team, president and CEO of LRE Water is Courtney Brand. Courtney is based out of Denver's, uh, the Denver office of LRE and has spent more than 25 years uh, providing expert consultation on engineering in the water industry. He's a recognized expert in hydrology, aquifer recharge, aquifer storage, and recovery systems. Courtney is also a registered professional geologist. Courtney has led many high profile groundwater analysis projects, including a multi phase aquifer storage pilot project for Denver Water, which included planning, permitting, geochemistry, site selection, conceptual design, and cost estimation. Lastly, uh, Adam, uh, Adam Jokris, PE, is going to guide us through the presentation. Uh, Adam is an experienced water resource professional, and his role with Greeley includes oversight of long-range water supply planning, our conservation and drought response programs, our water rights protection efforts, and our water acquisition program. Adam holds a Bachelor's of Science and Master's of Science degree in civil engineering. He's a registered professional engineer in the state of Colorado, and has worked on municipal water resource projects in Northern Colorado and across the West for more than 10 years in both the private and the public sectors. So with that, uh, I welcome you tonight, appreciate your attendance, and I'm gonna turn it over to Adam Jokrist to guide us through a presentation and overview. All right, well, thank you everybody. Uh, for joining us and we look forward tonight to answering any of your questions and also getting your feedback. Um, this is a complicated project with many facets and it's key to hear from our public uh, and let us know if we miss anything, what else we should be looking at and to answer any questions you have. 
Tonight, our agenda will be talking about how we plan for the future. Greeley has a long history of planning for the future, and this project is no different. We'll talk about how we got here. Why are we talking about the Terry Ranch project tonight? And we'll give a pretty in-depth overview of the Terry Ranch project. We'll spend some time focused on the water quality aspects of the project and answer any concerns you have. And then, like we said, we'll end with a question and answer session. So just a little bit of background on the Greeley water system. <clears throat> Greeley has a pretty expansive water system for a community of this size. We collect water from four uh, watersheds, the Laramie, Colorado, Poudre, and Big Thompson. We treat that water at two water treatment plants and we deliver it to your house through over 600 miles of pipe. Greeley has a very robust water supply uh, for today, but Greeley is growing. We expect to double in population in the next 40 to 50 years. And while our supply today is adequate, we need additional water uh, for the future. And we need to build those water sources in a way that maintains affordable water rates. One of the key needs that Greeley has is to develop new water storage. And when I say storage, I'm meaning a place to store water, and that can be in above ground reservoirs, in former gravel pits, or even below ground in aquifers. Aquifers are layers of rock, typically sand or gravel, uh, that water can be stored in. It has poor space that water can be stored in. Storage saves water in wet years for use in dry years. It's just like a bank account. Uh, when you have excess, you can deposit it, and when you need it, you can withdraw it. For many years, Greeley's uh, preferred project to gain additional supply and storage was the Milton Seaman Enlargement Project. Milton Seaman Reservoir is an existing reservoir located on the North Fork of the Poudre River near the mouth of the canyon northwest of Fort Collins. Sorry. Greeley's plan was to enlarge that reservoir from about 5,000 acre feet to over 50,000 acre feet, so about a 10x increase. When I say acre foot, what I'm talking about is uh, picture a foot of water on a football field. An acre foot of water serves two to three homes in Greeley per year. This map on the right shows the existing reservoir in light blue and the enlarged reservoir in dark blue. You can see that this is a very large reservoir enlargement. The inundation caused by this reservoir enlargement would impact wetlands, stream channel, and habitat for a threatened endangered species, the Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse. It would also inundate lands owned by the U.S. Forest Service, the state of Colorado, Larimer County open space, and a Fort Collins natural area. Because of these impacts, Greeley needs to acquire a litany of permits from federal and state agencies. Greeley has been pursuing diligently acquiring these permits for the last 15 years. In fact, we've spent $19 million to acquire these permits. Yet with all the environmental impacts, it's unlikely, uh, it's uncertain that Greeley would ever receive the necessary permits despite our efforts. Because of that, we looked at alternatives to the Milton Seaman enlargement. Some of the alternatives we looked at were part of the federal permitting process and some we evaluated on our own. We looked, this, this map to the left shows just some of the reservoir sites, alternative reservoir sites that we evaluated. This next map shows the location of various gravel pits that we evaluated for water storage. Ultimately, what we found is all these, all these other sites were either too expensive, did not provide the necessary volume, had even more environmental impacts than Milton Seaman or would result in very poor water quality. Through our alternative analysis, we uh, identified the Terry Ranch project as a potential alternative and we began to study it. Now the Terry Ranch project uh, is a underground aquifer that is classified as a non-tributary aquifer. This aquifer, is not connected to streams or other surface water. It's an isolated pocket of underground water. It's underlying the Terry Ranch. Now, Terry Ranch uh, is located in Northwest Weld County. Uh, if you've been up I-25 headed to Cheyenne, uh, right at the Colorado-Wyoming border, 
It's the ranch off to your right where there's some silhouettes of bison and camels. Um, it's about a 10,000 acre ranch with another 10,000 acres of state land interspersed. And that aquifer underlying that ranch has been decreed, meaning it has a private property right for 1.2 million acre feet. To put that in context, Greeley uses about 25,000 acre feet of water a year. So this is a large amount of water. More important than the water though, is the storage provided by this project underground. Greeley wouldn't be pursuing this project if it was just mining unrenewable groundwater. We're looking at this as a storage project. The way it would work, we would pump water out of the ground, treat it with a small treatment plant on the ranch, and then we would pipe it south through a new 30 mile pipeline and connect it into an existing pipeline just north of Windsor. When we wanna store water, we first have to treat that water. That's a rule of the EPA. We'd convey it through our, our existing pipelines and then we take it back north through that same 30 mile pipeline and pump it underground. Between the large amount of water already present and the ability to store water, Terry Ranch could meet Greeley's water needs for generations to come. Important to note is that Terry Ranch would be developed for droughts. This is not a, a water supply source that we would use day in and day out. It supplements, it does not replace our existing surface water sources. We will continue to grow our surface water sources and they will be the backbone. Terry Ranch is our insurance policy for when we run out of surface supplies. Underground storage is new to Greeley, um, but it is very common throughout the US. On the left, uh, you can see what happens when we inject water underground. It basically creates a bubble of uh, injected water that, except on the very periphery, does not mix with the, the groundwater that's present underground. Uh, that water is stored and then pumped out when we need it. Uh, some positive attributes of underground storage, very few environmental impacts. We don't need to build a, a dam or a reservoir and there's no evaporation. The evaporation that would have come off uh, in the large Milton Seaman Reservoir was enough to supply 3,000 homes in Greeley. So evaporation is a big loss. The negative side is that it requires a lot of pumping and treatment. Water has to be treated um, before it's injected and after it's withdrawn. Greeley is proposing to purchase this um, asset, this water and storage through a fairly unique um, transaction. The water is currently owned by a private company called Wingfoot Water Resources. And Greeley would purchase that water with credits rather than cash. So we would not be paying cash for this. We would be issuing credits and those credits are redeemable to meet Greeley's raw water dedication requirements. Raw water dedication is what developers have to pay the water and sewer department in order to get a new water tap. And it comes in the form of either water rights or cash. These credits would be a third source that developers could pay to Greeley in order to get those water taps. The credits do not represent water, wet water. They represent the ability to get a water tap. We'll be issuing a little over 12,000 credits and each credit is worth one acre foot of dedication. What this means is Greeley will forego future revenue in the form of collection of cash at the time of development. But in return, we receive all the water, all the storage, and $125 million from Wingfoot. That $125 million will be used to build the infrastructure to deliver the water. There's been some confusion in the public, I believe, about what the agreement does and does not do. And so just to clarify, the agreement gives Greeley access to the water up front. We immediately have access to develop the water and deliver it if we need to. It simply gives developers a third way to meet dedication. It does not replace our other means, our other forms of dedication like water and cash. It reduces our financial risk substantially. That's because revenue collected from development varies from year to year, depending on how much development is occurring in Greeley. The risk of that revenue stream is now pushed onto the seller. So Greeley reduces our financial risks. It also creates defaults and damages uh, for Greeley if in the future it were to no longer accept those credits. 
The agreement does not give Wingfoot any control over Greeley's water resources, either Terry Ranch or any other aspect. It does not benefit any other city. It does not sacrifice any of our existing water or restrict Greeley from buying other water sources. The only obligation we have is to continue to accept those credits and not devalue those credits. Greeley went under contract for the Terry Ranch project back in June, and we've spent the last seven months inspecting the property to make sure that it's going to be a safe and reliable water source. We've been reviewing those findings uh, for the last couple months, doing a lot of outreach, and uh, our city council will decide whether to close on this purchase on March 2nd. Some of the things we looked at in our inspection, we looked at the environmental conditions of the ranch. So if there's presence of um, wetlands or endangered species, archeological uh, findings, or sources of contamination. We looked at hydrogeology and geochemistry, which are just big words for the condition of the aquifer, the condition of the rock. We spend most of our time, or majority of our time, looking at water quality and our ability to treat this water. We designed it, we came up with a cost estimate, and very importantly, all the work that Courtney and our other consultants are doing are being reviewed by third-party, independent uh, peer reviewers that are national experts in their fields. We did an extensive amount of water quality analysis. We collected over 7,000 data points, tested for 575 com compounds, and we looked at water quality from seven wells uh, scattered across the ranch. Overall, the water quality is excellent. In fact, if this water was just blended um, amongst the various wells, uh, and had chlorine added to it, it would meet all regulations for clean drinking water. However, uranium is present. We discovered the presence of uranium in this water. This is naturally occurring uranium um, that comes from the rock itself. It is not the type of uranium that's used in nuclear power plants and such. Uh, it is at relatively low levels uh, and it is um, something that we can absolutely treat. Uranium can be removed by treatment. Uranium treatment is very common. It's very proven. It's used throughout the US. It's basically a large water softener. Water flows through a tank containing a media. That media absorbs the uranium and takes it out of the water. Really, current, our current water sources have low levels of uranium also, lower than Terry Ranch, but still present. That uranium is removed. Um, through our existing water treatment plants. And just like those plants, we'll remove it from Terry Ranch. To prove this, we ran a 30-day uh, pilot test. We took a miniature version of the treatment technology up to Terry Ranch, and we tested how it would perform with the actual water. It removed all detectable uranium. And so just to reinforce this, Greeley residents with the Terry Ranch project will not receive water with measurable uranium. Some of the additional water quality studies that we did, we injected water underground, uh, the actual water from the Bellevue water treatment plant, 150,000 gallons. We let it sit underground and we tested the quality when it came back out, uh, just to verify there weren't going to be any chemical reactions with the aquifer rock. We tested how that water would mix with our current sources. We did a long-term study where we let that water sit with the, the uh, rock from the aquifer and tested the water quality. We wanted to make sure that we weren't going to have any negative reactions in our distribution system by introducing a new water source. This is what happened in Flint, Michigan. A new water source was introduced and lead and copper from the pipes in people's houses leached into the water. We wanted to make sure that wasn't going to happen. So we did a variety of studies and we determined that it is safe to introduce this new water source. We looked at the condition of the well, and we looked at the potential for surface contamination. Regarding surface contamination, we looked at potential sources both on and off the ranch. And generally, the, the risk of surface contamination is low. This groundwater is very deep, very isolated. It's recharge, meaning how water uh, rainfall finally makes it down into the aquifer is very slow. It would take about 1400 years for rainfall to make it into this reservoir or into this aquifer. 
meaning 1400 years for any surface contamination in the recharge area to find its way into the aquifer. We looked at the potential for oil and gas contamination. There are no producing oil and gas wells on this ranch. And uh, there have been exploratory wells drilled in the past, um, but they've all been abandoned. That in some economic data leads us to believe that there is low hydrocarbon potential and very uh, low potential for oil and gas development in the future. We cannot say that there are no risks of surface contamination or that oil and gas will never occur, but it appears low risk. And one way to illustrate this is just to compare the surface conditions of Terry Ranch versus some other aquifers. This picture on the left is a view of Terry Ranch. It is undeveloped. It is grazing land for buffalo. The picture on the right is it's Denver. Denver overlies a aquifer that's used by thousands of people in the South Metro area. You can see that the, the surface uses are much less and that results in a lower risk of contamination. And it's not like we don't already have risks of surface contamination. This is an aerial view of Loveland. Greeley treats water from Lake Loveland and Boyd Lake. Uh, Boyd Lake and Lake Loveland are in an urbanized area and they suffer from urban runoff, which poses a risk of surface contamination. We don't have the ability to just flush out Boyd Lake and Lake Loveland and get rid of those contaminants because they could potentially just keep coming in. We treat them. We treat contamination. Greeley is good at treatment. We've been doing it for over 100 years, and we've won national awards, the best tasting water in the country, in fact, in, 19, in uh, 2017. We're confident we can treat the, our existing supplies, and we're confident we can treat the new supply through Terry Ranch. Terry Ranch is cheaper than the other alternatives we've looked at. This chart is a simple illustration of the cost of Terry Ranch over the next 50 years compared to that of Milton Seaman at two different sizes. And without going into the numbers, Terry Ranch is much cheaper. More importantly than its cost is the fact that it can be phased. We can build Terry Ranch slowly over the next coming decades. Uh, other reservoirs such as, or other options like Milton Seaman cannot, we cannot build a dam a foot at a time over the next you know, 50 years. Um, that phasing, that ability to build slowly over time uh, keeps our water rates low. Terry Ranch will be more expensive to operate. We need to pump this water, we need to treat it, uh, and that is a more expensive process. But the higher operational costs are very are vastly outweighed by the lower construction costs. So in summary, why Terry Ranch? Why are we, why are we um, recommending this project to city council? Terry Ranch has fewer environmental impacts and therefore requires fewer permits. We can begin construction on Terry Ranch immediately. Uh, in fact, if the council approves this, we suggest starting construction in early, early next year. It has a lower construction cost than all other alternatives that we've evaluated, and it can be built in phases. We can add wells as we need to, to add uh, additional water supply. That ability minimizes our water rates. The purchase structure we emit is very complex, um, but it reduces risks. It pushes risks onto the seller and it secures $125 million in owner financing. That also lowers our water rates. By adding groundwater to a surface water system, we add uh, diversity and we add a redundant supply. This groundwater is not subject to um, constraints like drought um, or water supply disruptions like fire, meaning that it's a very redundant supply. This is the kind of supply we want uh, in the, in the, whenever there's droughts. And then again, just to reiterate, following treatment, this water will be excellent. It will taste great. Uh, and we will, with that unequivocally, remove all measurable uranium before it is delivered to your home. We know this is a complex project um, and that it is a very important decision. And so we are committed to, to staying here tonight as long as it takes to answer um, at all the questions that you may have. So thank you. Um, there is a lot more information on our website and you can go to greeleygov.com slash Terry Ranch to find the results of all of our diligence studies, um, 
all the inspections and to learn more about this project. Thank you. Great, well, thank you, Adam, very much. Uh, just to remind anybody who has recently joined us, we're gonna move into the Q&A portion of our presentation. We had quite a few questions come in, so I will circle through those in the order in which they came. And uh, I will try to address these to the appropriate panelists. And Sean, you can help me out if uh, I need to adjust accordingly, okay? So our first question tonight is um, getting at the length and or the duration of the study. The water study done for one month was not long enough. Uh, this needs to be extended for six months. Why are we not, I'm sorry, need to be extended for six months. We are not planning to put water in for one month and take it out for one month. Um, so if we could maybe, Courtney, that might be best addressed by you uh, in terms of the water quality studies. And then there's a follow-up question to that about the cost of the water study. Sure, I can, I can kick it off. I mean, there were, two pilot studies that were conducted. One was a water treatment pilot study that was conducted continuously for 30 days. The other one was an ASR pilot uh, study, which is where we essentially injected uh, Bellevue water treatment plant water into the aquifer, stored it, and then recovered it. The water treatment pilot, which was studied, which was uh, conducted for 30 days, um, we took water from one of the wells, which is EB2, uh, ran it through a pilot treatment, which was essentially set up the exact um, same sort of configuration. A uh, full scale treatment process would be with essentially two columns of the media in series, um, flowed the water through those columns, and then we collected water from the feed, and then we collected water samples from the discharge from the pilot treatment plant. And uh, we did that throughout the 30 day uh, period. So. If the question is around the, the length of time, I think the length of time was adequate to show that this treatment process, ion exchange in this case, um, is effective at uh, treating and removing um, the uranium from the water. In terms of additional um, extended treatment or pilots, I think I'll let uh, city staff bring in on that one, but that's probably something that uh, may be done in the future, but at least right now we feel confident that the pilot treatment that was done to date shows that uh, it can definitely be treated and the uranium can be removed. I think to add on to that, uh, typical studies are in this time frame, and typically with groundwater supplies, the water uh, constituents are typically relatively stable. And so in a surface water pilot, you might go longer because you could be looking at different water qualities from storm events and different things like that. This doesn't happen in groundwater situations. So uh, we're just looking at how the, the treatment process works with the groundwater at the ranch. Um, uh, Adam Jokers, can you address the question regarding the cost of the water study? And, and I'll need some clarification. Is that the cost of the, uh, to treat the water or how much did the uh, cost of the diligent study uh, take? I'm gonna I read it. I read it to be the cost of the study to analyze both treatment and the injection. I don't have the specific cost of those individual pieces of our inspection. The total inspection, what we spent over the last uh, seven months, almost eight months now, uh, is just over $3 million. It was um, hundreds, thousands of hours, people on the ground, people in labs, uh, and our consultants behind the desk looking at this. Thank you. Our next question, uh, Adam Pryor, this might be best for you. Will our water lines need to be flushed out with the system? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, the systems for water treatment will have multiple redundancies um, that will protect any contaminants from getting into the water supply system. If there were any potential things that did get through, there's an extensive pipeline that would allow us to flush, but 
a part of any treatment process has built-in redundancy and backup systems for monitoring the water quality. It's the same as our existing water treatment plants. We have several levels of redundancy to protect any contaminants from getting into the system. We also would have full-time A operator staff on site to monitor the water quality and monitor anything happening at the plant. Thank you. I'll, I'm going to read this next question. I, I think I understand the context here, but uh, in relation to maybe a similar system used in Grand Island, the question is, will we have pink or red residue like they do in Grand Island who potentially uses the same systems we're planning to use? So I think I'll start with this and then maybe Courtney, you can add on. Um, based on the quick look at it, it's based on bacteria. Um, based on my very limited knowledge or, or basic knowledge of their systems, they're pulling water from surface water or the Ogallala Aquifer, which is basically a surface water. So there's a lot more uh, potential contaminations from surface streams or surface uh, deposits. And so some of their um, different water quality is a lot different from what we're proposing to do. And then Courtney, could you talk about maybe surface groundwater versus deep aquifer? Sure, I can, I can address that. Um, in this case, the upper Laramie aquifer, which is the target aquifer for the Terry Ranch project, is essentially a mostly confined. I saw another question come through whether the aquifer is confined and it is mostly confined. There are portions across or portions of the ranch where it's not confined, but essentially it's a fairly deep bedrock aquifer, which is a different type aquifer system than alluvial or shallow groundwater, which is in fairly direct connection with the surface water or the stream. In this case, it's non-tributary groundwater. It is not connected with the surface water system. And because of that, it's also a couple things. It's one protected more from uh, surface activities, uh, surface water, you know, contaminants, things like that. Um, secondly, it is also, um, it it does not have the sort of biological bacteria growth, things like that, that you might see in shallow groundwater, alluvial groundwater that's connected with river systems. I might just add the uh, Grand Island case, um, Grand Island pumps from shallow wells uh, that are connected to the North or to the Platte River. Um, and they do suffer some seasonal variability. Uh, they do have bacterial growth. They also have iron and manganese. Um, those are issues we evaluated and it's, it's just a very different water quality. We will not have coloration issues. I'm gonna bounce back to the Milton Seaman Reservoir and the question is, will we continue to pursue enlarging Milton Seaman? Uh, Harold, that might be one for you and Sean. Excuse me, I've got to un unmute here. Uh, in the short run, no, we would not continue to uh, enlarge Milton Seaman. We want to keep that option open so that uh, decades in the future that it might be possible, but uh, it will uh, stay as a 5,000 foot uh, acre reservoir, will continue to be an integral part of our Poudre River system as it has been since it was uh, constructed in the early uh, 1940s. So, uh, Nothing will essentially change with, with Seaman Reservoir, but we will keep the option open to expand it in the future. We will not close that option out. Thank you, Harold. Uh, Adam Pryor, this uh, might be a good question for you as well. Can we pump more water into the aquifer without taking water out? I think that's a better one for Courtney. That one. I think it's a great question. Um, you know, a couple of things factor in, one of which the aquifer isn't completely filled. I mean, there's plenty of uh, uh, sand lenses, things like that in the aquifer that are not completely filled. Um, so uh, they, they can be filled as part of this process, as well as when you're conducting an ASR project and you're directly injecting water down into the groundwater, what essentially happens is you're displacing the groundwater that's there. Uh, pushing it out of the way, 
with the water that you're injecting, in this case, treated surface water. And what happens is you displace that groundwater and you'll see a rise in water levels around the well and, and uh, uh, some distance a little bit around the well. But essentially um, the aquifer, it's a very large system. I mean, Terry Ranch and the property that over the property of Terry Ranch that oversized overlays the aquifer is only a very small part of the system. So there is a lot of storage capacity both in the unsaturated zone and in the saturated zone in the aquifer that could be used for storage. Courtney, I'm gonna ask you to maybe elaborate a little bit with this next question. So you kind of touched on this a little bit. How full is the aquifer now and how much can it hold by pumping in water? Is that water pumped in during free river flows? Um, I'll let city staff handle the question about like when, like when would water be uh, diverted and stored, whether it's free river or other types of circumstances. But in terms of the volumes that can accommodate, I couldn't tell you exactly how much because it's a very large system. But what we did do uh, very early on is we uh, constructed a groundwater flow model using ModFlow, which is your very common uh, modeling software used in the industry. And we modeled injecting um, fairly large amounts of water, essentially what the sort of build out uh, kind of maximum amount of water that would be um, injected into the aquifer. We operated the model to see one, what would be the impact to water levels in terms of how much they would rise. And then secondly, um, how fast would the water flow and flow away from the wells after it was injected. The conclusion from that modeling is that there, uh, the aquifer can easily accommodate the sorts of volumes of water that uh, the city is looking at um, injecting into the aquifer. And on the question uh, when water would be pumped in, <clears throat> um, we would use a variety of water rights. It wouldn't be free water or free river conditions um, necessarily. It would be, we would use our converted agricultural rights, um, conditional decrees. Sorry, this is technical, but water, water rights are. Um, so conditional storage decrees, um, we would use uh, West Slope water through the uh, Windy Gap and Colorado Big Thompson projects and others. So there's a variety of sources uh, and we would uh, have to first treat that. Uh, and so we would be filling this reservoir um, whenever there's excess treatment capacity at our Bellevue plant. Sean, I think this next question is for you. Can you elaborate on the timeline and uh, progression of this project and then remind folks again when it's gonna to go to city council? Sure, thanks Kelly. Um, so <clears throat> maybe st starting back a bit further, uh, the, the city first learned about this project in um, around the third quarter, second quarter of 2019. Uh, we looked extensively into uh, the site and the decree and pilot wells that were being drilled on the site. Uh, thereafter, learned about water quality, uh, visited with our water and sewer board a number of times about the opportunity to pursue this as a, a parallel project to be evaluated uh, in our federal permitting analysis of alternatives. Uh, in uh, June of 2020, we entered into the master purchase and sale agreement uh, with Wingfoot Water, and that kicked off the extensive diligence and investigative period that Adam uh, Jokeris described. So now we're at the end of that period and we have firm conclusions in hand. The project will go to Water and Sewer Board on the 17th of February, uh, so that's right around the corner, and we're seeking their formal endorsement at that time. Uh, and their authorization to close on the agreement. Thereafter, the project goes to city council. Um, it, it will go for a first reading of an ordinance uh, actually on the 16th of February, but there's no public or, or action at that time. The action meeting happens on March 2nd. Uh, at March, the March 2nd date has been moved up. Uh, it was moved up at the request of a city council member who wanted to be sure he would be able to vote on uh, the Terry Ranch project. So uh, staff has taken that direction and accommodated uh, the wishes of the council member and the manager. 
Adam Joker, so I'm going to send this next question your way because I've heard you answer it, uh, but feel free to pass that on if, if you'd like. Why is Greeley positioned to purchase this and not other communities in the front range like Loveland, Fort Collins, or Cheyenne, for example? Yeah, uh, you know, part of this is uh, serendipity and part of it um, was that we were in a position to be looking for other alternatives. Um, Wingfoot Water Resources uh, took over this project and perfected the, the decree, the, the private property right, in 2017 and did market it up and down the front range to communities. But at that time, uh, there were no data on this project. Um, there was a decree, a piece of paper, but no water quality data, uh, no data on the, the rock formation, no data on um, how much water could be pumped out or injected. Uh, so Wingfoot uh, developed five wells and um, did extensive testing. And that happened to overlap with the time Greeley was in an alternatives evaluation. We identified that project at this time. And so we actually um, began evaluating this before even all that, that data came in. Greeley is also very well positioned uh, to make use of this water. Um, we have infrastructure that spans all the way from Bellevue, west of Fort Collins, to Greeley. And uh, we're in a position to be able to connect this, this new water source into existing uh, pipelines. Uh, many other communities would need a much longer pipeline, a lot more pumping. Greeley can flow this water from the ranch to our residents by gravity. Can I add to that, and Kelly, and just note that Many of the other communities that uh, shopped this water and who were excited by it, like Greeley was, are in a position where they need water tomorrow from the water rights they're purchasing, right? They have a situation where their supply doesn't greatly exceed their demand. And so when they acquire a water right in some of these communities, they need to be able to turn that into wet water delivered to customers rather quickly. Greeley's ongoing and historic investment, its persistence at developing surface water assets and the storage and the treatment capacity that it has at Bellevue and at Boyd Lake, um, put it in a position where we can afford to develop this project over time in a way that other communities wouldn't be able to. And we have the surface water that allows us to make best use of that aquifer storage component. So that's, a, that's an interesting piece that makes Greeley a little bit different than some of these other communities. And we simply have a long range growth plan that shows that we're gonna grow in a way that Loveland or others won't grow. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Harold, if you could address this next question, does the Terry Ranch Aquifer Project not require water court approval? It does not require water court, water court approval because it already has been through water court and is a decreed water right for the full 1.2 million acre feet. That was one of the things that made this attractive to us. And it was not only uh, decreed for the 1.2 million acre feet, it also has what's known as a banking privilege in uh, Colorado groundwater law. You can withdraw one one hundredth per year of the aquifer. So you could withdraw 12,100 acre feet uh, uh, per year, but you have a banking provision that in any year you do not use the full amount, you can bank that and carry it over. And uh, so there's, uh, uh, hasn't been any water really withdrawn from the aquifer since the decree. So all that has been, um, has been banked uh, as well. Uh, to, so and the other thing that's really important about this particular water that a water right that made it attractive to us, as Adam mentioned to start with, it is decreed as non-tributary water, which means under Colorado water law that it can be used to extinction. It is called wholly consumable water. Uh, we can take the uh, water that you uh, would run down your shower drain, uh, out of your sink, out of your toilet, goes through our wastewater treatment plant, and we can reclaim that equal volume of water to reuse it again. Uh, if you do, if it is not a if it's a tributary source, which means it's hydraulically connected to the river, uh, you have to augment that. So this is uh, we can actually get more than one use out of this water as well. But 
Now, the answer to the question is, it is already decreed and does not have to go back to water court. Thanks, Harold. Our next question, uh, maybe Adam Pryor, what chemical are you going to use in the ion exchange? So ion exchange isn't a chemical, it's actually a resin that exchanges ions. Uh, so it's a specific one targeting uranium. And so it's not all ions. And so it's kind of like a, a water softener. It exchanges uh, certain ions like uh, metals or, or something that's hard in the water and softens water. Uh, this same technology removes uranium only. It was specifically chosen to remove uranium. I think we touched on this a little bit, Courtney, when you were talking, so I'm not sure if this is one for you to answer, maybe city staff, but how would the volume of water pumped in compare to the natural input? Um, I'm not exactly sure, <laughs> to, to tell you the truth, to be honest, because we'd have to look at how much um, would plan to be um, injected into the aquifer over time, the volumes versus the volumes of recharge. Again, it's a large aquifer system and the recharge area is, is relatively large to the aquifer as well. So the actual total recharge to the aquifer system, I'm not exactly sure how much it is um, to tell you the truth. Uh, let's see, Harold and Sean, maybe this next question for the two of you. From a high level perspective, what gives Greeley leadership heartburn about this project? What are the major hurdles? Well, I'll start and I'll let Sean pick it up is that uh, right now with the extensive amount of due diligence that we have done, uh, I think we have satisfied that uh, this project is feasible and will work for Greeley and will be a project that will be financially beneficial for Greeley as far as minimizing our cost for our future water rights. Uh, I guess uh, what would maybe keep me up at night is, is if we, for some reason, find a fatal flaw in the next uh, week, and uh, we go back into the federal permitting process to try to get the uh, Milton Seaman project uh, permitted. Uh, my judgment after uh, spending uh, over 15 years on the semen permitting process, starting back with our very first scoping meeting in 2006, is that I really don't think that we'll get a permit for semen reservoir. I think there will be other permit, other options that the Corps of Engineers will determine are what's known as the LEPTA, which is the least practical damaging environmental alternative. Uh, I don't think any of those will be nearly as advantageous to our water users as Terry Ranch will be. So mine's just the opposite is if we, for some reason, don't do it, what our alternatives are, and our alternatives are really not very pleasant at this, this point in time. Uh, give you an example of the things that uh, we've been asked to look at by the permitting agency. Uh, one was a site south of Carter Lake called uh, Dry Creek that we'd have to pump water from Bellevue, from the, from the Poudre River all the way down south of Carter Lake store it there, pump it back. Uh, another option was called Cactus Hill Reservoir, which is um, a reservoir up north of Highway 14 near Black Hollow Reservoir. Same type of thing. Uh, so I uh, think we have done more due diligence uh, than any other project that I know in my 24 years on this board. I've never seen this level of investigation, this level of due diligence on any project we've done. And I think we've, uh, any questions that's been raised that we've gone, and as Courtney can tell you with the amount of work we've asked his firm to do, that any time there's been a question raised, uh, we've gone and done extensive investigation to make sure that it's not a problem. So I think this is a unique opportunity for Greeley. We call it a generational opportunity. I think uh, if we uh, proceed with this, uh, it'll be looked at 50 years from now or 60 years from now, the equivalent to what uh, the Colorado Big Thompson project is that was conceived by Greeley people in the 1930s, and we now look back at it uh, as one of our major uh, keystones of our system. So that's my uh, my concern is is that we for some reason don't don't move forward with it. 
Maybe I can add on to that, Kelly, to say, um, you know, the analysis is really important to decision making. And I agree with Harold that um, the across the West, particularly on the Colorado Front Range, long range water supply and storage options are complex, difficult and extremely expensive. And uh, we have an obligation here in the Water and Sewer Department to be planful, um, to serve our customers cost effectively, high quality, safe, reliable water. And, um, and doing that can be challenging. Uh, so uh, I'm very interested to see um, all of the uh, expert opinions and the third party expert opinions uh, come in and, um, and see those presented to the Water and Sewer Board and have a uh, robust conversation with the board uh, about that. Um, I will say, you know, we have acknowledged and it's a reality that the, um, the operational costs with this project are greater than they would be with a, a general surface reservoir. The caveat to that is, of course, if, you're, if your surface water reservoir is a long distance from your treatment plant, right? And Harold talked about some of the, the options that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was driving Greeley towards these, um, these surface water reservoirs that were either out on the, the plains or they were a long way south down by Berthoud. And so we would, we would technically have as much or more pumping involved in those configurations. Uh, if we use ditch systems where possible, we'd be uh, experiencing degradation of water quality, uh, the likely use of RO, which is reverse osmosis treatment under super high pressure filtration to remove that, um, those salts from the poor water quality resulting from running it in the ditches out there. So we're not looking at any, um, any surface water or groundwater options that are real friendly in operational cost terms. But um, the reality is this will be our most expensive supply to operate. And that's another good reason for it to be our drought supply. Uh, we want to make sure that um, we, we leverage this to make it through times of uncertainty, uh, but we'll continue to rely upon those water rights that our, our ancestors and forefathers in this community developed. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of challenge to bringing this project online. We're in the midst of that now. And I'll say part of my duty uh, and responsibility um, is to make sure that the organization continues to build its technical, its financial, and its managerial capacity um, to operate all of these different systems. We have one of the most robust um, water resource portfolios collecting water from four major basins, two treatment plants. When this is developed, if it's approved, it'll be a third treatment plant. And so making sure the organization is well positioned to manage all of that effectively is important. Uh, thanks, Sean. Both you and Harold touched on this. So I'm going to ask this next question because it's in relation to some of the information you've just shared. And that is um, maybe you want to elaborate a little bit more on the contingency plan if Terry Ranch uh, doesn't work out. Well, you can go first this time, Sean, and I'll fall back, call back cleanup. Yeah, I'll, I'll say, you know, I alluded to that, and I think Adam and Harold have part of this answer. They're, um, they're a little bit more waist deep in the federal permitting experience, but um, we would be back at the drawing table, right? We have a comp plan uh, for a, a city of Greeley that has um, extensive growth in its future. Weld County is a place that people wanna live and do business. Um, affordable housing is important to us in this community. Uh, so we're challenged with making sure we can deliver affordable, firm, reliable water through 2060 and beyond. And we know based on the state demographer and other research firms that we're going to be needing to serve a community of more than 250,000 people. So uh, we'll have to be back at the drawing table and working on solutions that get us there. Let me back up for just a minute as part of this answer and that as a policymaker, it's real easy to get involved down in the weeds and all the technical details. And particularly if you have a background like an engineering background, like I do. But also as a policymaker, you need to look at the big picture. And the big picture is that we live in a rapidly growing 
region. The state demographer's office projects that Larimer and Well counties will double by 2050. A uh, data point that I use is that uh, I came to Greeley in 1971 and we had just gone over 40,000 people. Uh, today we're 115. I don't think it's unreason to reach the numbers that we're projecting. So I think uh, whether you like the growth or don't like the growth, think it's good, think it's bad, we're in an area that's going to be growing. And we as policymakers need to recognize that. We also are in an area that has a finite water supply. Uh, I do not think we will ever see another Colorado Big Thompson project bring the equivalent of another Poudre River uh, over the Continental Divide or under the Continental Divide in this case. Uh, our friends on the West Slope uh, uh, will see that that will never happen. The water supplies we have today are the water supplies that we're gonna have 50 years from now. So we have a water short area. In the 1930s, when they initiated the Colorado Big Thompson project. They did that because in the drought of the 30s, this area was water short. We've been living on that uh, historical investment uh, ever since. Uh, so we, we've got to recognize that we are in a water short area. In Greeley's case, we also have a very large agricultural economy that we would like to see maintain its viability. Uh, unfortunately, the most of the water sources that are available today are ditch company shares. As we know, our friends uh, from the south have been buying, including Aurora, have been buying water rights in the Weld County area. Uh, we would like to minimize the amount of water that is taken out of irrigated agriculture. Terry Ranch does that in that it is a source of water that is not used for irrigation today. So it will help maintain that agricultural economic base that we're, that we're very fortunate to, to have in Well County. So as far as what we go forward, uh, we're gonna be challenged as a region as to how do we balance out all of the, the growth, the uh, environmental aspects, the agricultural aspects. It's gonna take a lot of leadership from a lot of people to figure this out. And I think Greeley is well positioned to do that. And I think Terry Ranch fits into that very, very well. Thank you. Uh, Harold, I'm gonna hit you with the next question as well. I'm gonna rephrase or paraphrase this one a little bit, but uh, we've had a lot of scrutiny for the uh, uh, location in which our water and sewer leadership live. Harold, can you address that? I'd be happy to address that, Kelly. Uh, there's no requirement uh, in the city employment that uh, our staff, have to live within the city limits of Greeley. Uh, Sean and Adam, neither one live in Greeley. That has no bearing on their professionalism or their competency or their work ethic. The Water and Sewer Board, there are seven citizen volunteers on the Water and Sewer Board that are appointed by city council for five-year terms. The city manager, the mayor, and the finance director are non-voting members of our board. That does not mean that they're not non-participating. The charter, the city council does require our water and sewer board members to live in the city of Greeley. Combined, those seven water and sewer board members today have served the city of Greeley and their water and sewer board capacity for 140 years combined time. There are four of those members who were born and raised in Greeley. Two of them have lived their all their total adult life in Greeley. Uh, I think the aspect that Sean and Adam do not live in Greeley has no bearing whatsoever on their job performance. And I think it's a, it's a red herring to try to, uh, to just put uh, a bad light on their performance. And I can tell you as someone who has uh, spent a career in construction engineering, I'm very pleased to have them on our staff and they're doing a great job for the city of Greeley. I'll just add to that, that I do live in the city of Greeley too. So, and I'm staff. As do I, thanks Adam. Uh, I wanna be mindful of our time and we have several other questions. Uh, so if we can't make it through all of the questions this evening, 
we will commit to uh, posting some responses to those. We will add those to our webpage in a way that allows people to get a response if we can't quite make it through everything. So we'll carry on for just a short amount of time here and get a few more questions in and then we'll wrap things up. But if your question wasn't asked, uh, we will do our best to get those answers turned around quickly and posted on the greeleygov.com slash Terry Ranch webpage. Can the water stored in the aquifer, in the Terry Ranch aquifer, be used only for non-potable uses? Also, where does that water that is taken from the surface water and put into the aquifer impact the water available for use by Greeley Water customers? Maybe I'll take that one. No, the, the water from Terry Ranch will be used for both, uh, for potable uses. Um, it will be you. The, the, we can reuse it, as Harold said, um, for non-potable uses, and we would do that by um, using our treated wastewater effluent. And we we don't take that directly into our non-potable system. But we take a like amount of river water uh, from the Lower Poudre River, and we irrigate our parks and cemeteries and golf courses. So first use will be potable. Second use could be non-potable. Um, with regards to will it uh, affect the water that we're delivering to Greeley, no. Uh, when we're injecting um, water into this aquifer, we're only treating water above what our citizens need at that time. So we're using excess capacity, meaning unused uh, space in our Bellevue treatment process uh, to, create, to treat the water to deliver to Terry Ranch. Uh, the next question is a treatment question. So maybe uh, Adam Pryor and perhaps Courtney. Are you going to use an ion exchange for both, both the cat ion and the anion since anion. uranium requires? Say it again, Adam. Anions. Anions, thank you. Uh, since uranium requires anion treatment and hardness requires cat ion treatment. So right now there's no treatment for hardness. The water quality um, for hardness isn't high enough to merit um, treatment on that. And so the focus is uranium and taking that to non-detect, which is an anion. Uh, another treatment question. How are you recharging the media and how do you plan on disposing of the removed uranium? So we looked at several different vendors that could supply the equipment and media. Uh, the one that we're looking at as a potential um, alternative would actually take the media um, and then dispose of it, or they could be beneficially reuse the uranium for other purposes. Um, having that as an option uh, really is advantageous, but there's several different options out there. Uh, Adam, I think maybe one more for you. How often are the EPA tests ran to check for uranium? Adam Jokers might be a better one on that one. Um, yeah, you know, the, uh, the frequency that we need to test our water depends on its source and water quality. Um, we would not, the EPA wouldn't be testing this, we would be testing it. And we would be testing it at a frequency um, to know for sure that we are we're treating out the uranium. Um, ion exchange technology is, is a very well understood uh, treatment process. And so it's, um, it's very easy to predict uh, at how long the media can be used and when you should start getting concerned that the media needs to be replaced and perhaps some uranium isn't fully being removed. Um, we're designing this system to have two ion exchange tanks in series. So any uranium not caught by the first one, first tank, is going to be removed in the second. Um, we'll monitor the, the uranium concentration in the water uh, through those tanks, between those tanks, uh, regularly enough to know when it is time uh, to change out that media. Um, but in no instance would there be a opportunity that both tanks would be full, uh, or the media in both tanks would be so used up that somehow uranium could get passed. 
And I think to add to that, um, the pilot study showed that the first tank uh, fully removed it to non-detect levels. So if there was ever any that did get through the first tank, the second would pick it up even more. Um, and then part of the building in redundancy is having backup um, vessels ready to go. So if you are exchanging out some media, you have another vessel already to put into series to maintain the water quality. What is the projected cost per acre foot to acquire and build necessary infrastructure to deliver and treat the water? And how does this compare to current CBT and projected semen reservoir expansion? I'll, I'll jump on this um, and maybe Harold, you can back me up. Um, our projected 50 year cost to develop Terry Ranch uh, the Greeley's portion of the cost, so that this takes away the 125 million that Wingfoot is contributing, is about 250 million dollars in today's dollars. Those, those that, that expenditure will be spread out over many years, so we're converting all that into today's dollars. Uh, in comparison, um, I think the most recent cost estimate for the Northern Integrated Supply Project that you referenced is 1.2 million. Um, or sorry, 1.2 billion. Um, this is a bit different um, in terms of cost per acre foot because it's coming with 1.2 million acre feet of uh, decreed storage space and, and water. And so if you put it on a dollar per acre foot basis, uh, Terry Ranch is extremely low. We don't think that's a very fair comparison, um, but the dollar per acre foot would be, you know, less than $100, so. Adam, I don't really have much to add to that other than uh, the cost of building storage keeps going up every day. Uh, the cost of infrastructure, the cost of water. Uh, Colorado Big Thompson water right now is selling for about $65,000 per unit, uh, depending upon what the uh, you use as the annual quota. If you use 75% uh, uh, as your annual quota, uh, that's putting you up close to a, you know, $100 uh, per acre uh, for CBT water. Uh, it's hard to say what the NIST water will cost because nobody knows uh, when the NIST project will uh, be constructed, if at all. Uh, we all hope that it will be, but I think there's a good chance that there's going to be uh, extensive litigation over that. Uh, our experience in all of the new reservoir projects in Colorado, they all get stymied with litigation from the environmental community. Uh, so until you really know when you're going to start construction, it's really hard to say what a cost is going to be. Uh, our evaluation is, is that the Terry Ranch project is uh, the most cost effective alternative that we've been able to find at this point in time. Uh, Adam Joker, so I think maybe the next two questions are for you, um, just based on uh, your experience and expertise. Uh, the first one is, how long was the water in the water quality study left in the aquifer before it was pumped out? And how, did this, how does this compare to the time the treated water would be left in the aquifer before actual use when the system is up and running? Actually, I'll, I'll defer the, the specifics of the injection test to Courtney. Uh, the ASR pilot testing we conducted, we did two tests. One was a, what we call one day test. The other one was a three day test. But in terms of the storage period that the water was left in the aquifer during the first test, it was approximately one day or 24 hours. And then the second test, it was left in the aquifer for a little bit over four days. When we operate, the storage uh, times will be much longer. Um, I don't have a specific time period because it depends on when the next drought occurs. Um, but perhaps Courtney, you can talk to why a short-term injection test gives us indications whether or not long-term uh, aquifer storage and recovery is safe or, or feasible. Sure. I mean, in this case with the pilot, uh, some of the main objectives we were looking at was primarily around um, you know, how the water quality 
of the stored water might change while it uh, is stored in the aquifer and it interacts with the aquifer materials. And then the other main objective we were looking at is specifically, we know that there is naturally occurring uranium in the groundwater, um, but would there be a possibility where you could um, leach or mobilize um, uranium that's more in a solid form that's sorbed onto the aquifer materials? Could you essentially leach that and kind of bring it in as you're recovering the water. Those reactions, which are referred to oxidation reduction or redox reactions, um, actually happen quite quickly. Um, they happen on the order of tens of hours or days. Uh, we don't need to leave the water in the aquifer for very long periods of time to see those reactions occur. So it's typically a, a test like we did of let's say four days of leaving it in uh, leaving the water in storage in the aquifer is a pretty good indicator if we're going to see uh, redox reactions, in this case potentially mobilizing um, uranium or arsenic from the aquifer, we would see indications of those even in a relatively short period of time. Uh, Harold, maybe if you could address uh, our uh, contract with Wingfoot, granting these credits to a third party, doesn't it create actions of price fixing with regard to water costs to the public and developers? It does not, by the way it is structured in that uh, when Adam was mentioning the cash, the raw water dedication, uh, today you can generate, you can dedicate actual water, either CBT or historic irrigated water from the land or you can pay cash in lieu. Uh, we will continue to have our cash in lieu price that is set annually by the, by the Water and, and Sewer Board. For 2021, that cash in lieu price is $36,000. That, uh, by us setting that annual cash in lieu price and being willing to uh, accept that from developers and builders, we essentially, set a cap on the market in that uh, the Wingfoot people would not be able to go out and charge $50,000 for a credit if we're willing to take $36,000 for a credit. So part of the way it's structured is, is that uh, we will continue our normal practices, will continue to be available for uh, our developers and builders. If they don't want to need, want to have to do uh, business with Wingfoot, they don't have to, they can still uh, come to City of Greeley and either dedicate water or they can pay our normal cash in lieu price that we have a standard calculation on. So we built in that, uh, that safety factor. Uh, we have no guarantee to Wingfoot as to uh, the timing as to when they may sell those credits, uh, what price they may sell them to, sell them for. That's strictly all on their, their risk. Uh, all we have committed to our obligation is if, if once they have uh, sold those to a developer or a builder, that we will honor them. So I think we've got that safety factor built, built in that there will not be a quote price fixing on this. Thanks Harold, if you can maybe hang on for a second, I'm gonna ask another question in relation to the agreement. And that question is, uh, does Wingfoot get revenue from all of the water sold by the city of Greeley? And the attendees pointing to Article 12 of the Master Purchase Agreement of Terry Ranch, that there's an, uh, uh, maybe something in there that identifies an agreement to share revenue with Wingfoot. Can you address that? Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm not sure what our Article 12 is was out digging out my, my copy of it, but uh, the water that will be provided to uh, a development, to a new project uh, uh, through the city of Greeley will that revenue will be 100% to the city of Greeley. Uh, if there is untreated water from the ranch that is sold, uh, we will uh, share a, I think it's 50-50 50, uh, 50 /50 share uh, on any untreated water. Uh, say if there is uh, some, somebody wants to haul water off of the ranch. Uh, for any treated water that is sold outside of the city of Greeley's service area, uh, they would get a 50 cent per thousand gallon royalty, uh, similar to what a royalty would be on oil and gas rights. Right now, uh, we don't sell any water outside of our service area. 
uh, other than a few taps that were on that are on our transmission mains from historical purposes. We do treat water for the city of Evans, the city of Milligan, and the city of Windsor, and we charge them for treating that water. And that water, they have to provide raw water sources to us. So, if in the event in the future we did sell water outside of our service area, which I don't envision we would because we're doing this to take care of our citizens first and foremost, there would be a, uh, a royalty on it. Uh, the other thing was built in is that, as Adam said, that the water from Terry Ranch, once it's pumped out of the ground, will flow to Greeley by gravity. Uh, we are going to build in the potential in the future for hydropower generation. And uh, if in the future there was hydropower generation, uh, which would be extra revenue for Greeley, uh, we do have a sharing provision with Wingfoot on that. But uh, the basic water that uh, uh, is sold to our customers, they will get no share in. And thanks, Harold. For reference, can someone just quickly address how much is an acre foot or one credit today? So uh, our, our current cash in lieu rate is $36,500. Um, well, I guess that will be effective in March. Uh, that's the new 2021 20, rate. Um, a cr we anticipate that credits will be sold for less than our cash in lieu rate. So somewhere less than that. So Adam, I think the, the question was how much is an acre foot? An acre foot is 326,000 oh. gallons. Is that correct, Kelly? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both, but okay. what it is actually, and then the cost. Right. So an acre, an acre foot is 326,000 gallons, or as Adam said, it's approximately a football field with 12 inches of water on it. Uh, Courtney, I think you might be able to take this next question for us. Uh, years ago, when they pumped water from Rocky Flats, there were earthquakes resulting from that pumping. That's really more of a statement, but I'm uh, guessing here that the question is, is there a risk of that with our Terry Ranch project? Okay, and maybe just for clarification, was it water pumped from Rocky Flats or water injected? This um, says years ago when they pumped water from Rocky Flats. Okay, I'm not aware of um, earthquakes from groundwater pumping in Rocky Flats. There has been similar questions related to ASR projects where you're injecting and storing water in the ground regarding question as to whether you could cause or create earthquakes. I think in this, because one thing is uh, people can also think of some of the disposal activities with oil and gas or things like that, that uh, um, dispose of uh, uh, into deep aquifers. And sometimes I know like Oklahoma, some places there have been some um, earthquakes related to that. In this case, uh, the water would not be injected under very high pressure. We would not be injecting water under pressures that would cause or create earthquakes. In this case, um, you're talking very low, relatively system type pressures, you know, 50, 60, 70 uh, PSI with, uh, with the additional pressure drop from the surface to the groundwater table. So we're talking about relatively low pressures uh, that would not cause or create any earthquakes. Uh, our next question, I'm going to lump a couple of these together. There's been much scrutiny and um, concern about poisoning Greeley's water with uranium. So specifically, the question here is, uh, what is the lowest parts per billion that EPA test measures? And what test standards do you use for certifying this test? I'm, I might jump in. Um... The level of detection, so it's the lowest amount of uranium that uh, the best test today can detect uranium is 0 0.2 parts per billion. Uh, so that's micrograms per liter. Um, in all of our testing, we used uh, standard methods. Uh, the, the EPA publishes standard methods of how we should run all these tests. And, and that's what the labs did where we sent our samples to be analyzed. Thanks, Adam. I'm not sure, Adam, if this is for you or maybe if it's back to Courtney, but uh, what tests were run on the water? The total dissolved solids, total suspended solids, and total solids, harness phosphate, nitrogen, et cetera. Courtney, I'll just like chime in. Maybe it'd be easier to say which ones weren't, <laughs> weren't actually analyzed for because um, we collected extensive water quality data. We ended up 
um, collecting over 7,000 data points, which included um, at least 577 different uh, water quality constituents that we, uh, that we analyzed for, including all constituents that you have to um, analyze for, for a new drinking water source. So um, it was extensive. And I think some of the examples were TDS or total dissolved solids, TSS, hardness, phosphate, nitrogen, yes. Yes to all of those, essentially pretty much anything and everything, um, semi-volatiles, volatiles, organics, inorganics, metals, um, everything. So uh, we, it was very extensive. Sean, maybe you can help me direct this one. Uh, this is about the surface land. Is there a future possibility of surface land, surface land conservation easements to protect the deep aquifer from future encroachment development? Yeah, the, the simple answer, Kelly, is yes. Um, although Greeley uh, currently isn't in a contract to acquire the surface land, if you've been up to the site, uh, you can see that it is um, contiguous essentially to a number of other conserved properties that essentially create a peak to prairie type um, integrated land uh, conservation pattern from the plains ecosystems up to the foothills ecosystems. Uh, but I'm gonna let Adam answer a little bit um, in more detail based on his conversations uh, with land ownership out there. I guess all I would say is that it's a, it would be a willing buyer, willing seller. Um, I think Greeley is interested in, in preserving that land. Um, and we would look forward to exploring options um, to preserve it. Harold, another question regarding our Wingfoot agreement. Uh, will, will Wingfoot receive any water credits that will impact the water available to the shareholders in Greeley Irrigation Company Ditch 3? No, that's just, it, it will not. So there's not any more I can elaborate on. Little follow-up, I think, to that one in this next question. Uh, will Wingfoot only benefit from water sold to Greeley, i.e. the water in Terry Ranch and the state water? Greeley, Wingfoot will only, uh, restate the question, please, like how it was phrased. Or will Wingfoot only benefit from the water sold to Greeley, um, i.e. the water in Terry Ranch and state water? Okay. Wingfoot will only benefit when they can sell the water credits that we are exchanging for all of the Terry Ranch uh, assets. Uh, we will acquire uh, the 1.2 million acre feet of decreed water. Uh, we'll have the five existing production wells. Uh, we'll have the uh, surface area leases, an assignment of the lease from the state land board. So uh, they only uh, will benefit when they ultimately can sell the credit. So uh, uh, we're, we're giving up a undetermined long-term revenue source from our cash in lieu payments. Uh, and they're taking on that risk. So they only benefit when they sell the water credits to a third party and that third party uh, will have to bring those water credits to the city of Greeley for redemption. They cannot take them to any other, any other city. They're only good to satisfy Greeley's raw water dedication requirement. And Wingfoot is really, they're betting to come on, uh, Greeley's gonna grow. Uh, they're making an investment in our community that they think it will be uh, one of the leading places in Northern Colorado in the future. If they're wrong, they won't, uh, won't benefit as much. I'm not sure who this would be best suited to answer. The question is actually asking about where else we might find aquifers being used. And it says, is there a sample case study of another municipal water supply in the US similar to Terry Ranch that utilizes an underground aquifer model? Well, Perhaps uh, Courtney, oh, I'm sorry. No, Adam. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, I think Courtney has more extensive experience with the South Metro group where uh, the WISE partnership stores water from Aurora and Denver water in wet years in the sandstone aquifer that is uh, very much akin to 
the aquifer at Terry Ranch. Um, so that's where I would point you to as an example of a, a functioning aquifer storage and recovery system in the sandstone aquifer in Colorado. But Courtney, do you want to elaborate sure. on what you know about that situation and others across the West? Sure. I think the closest best example um, is Highlands Ranch there in the South Metro, um, south of Denver area. Centeno, Centennial Water and Sanitation District is the water provider. Um, they've been uh, they've been operating ASR wells now for, boy, um, it's got to be 25 to 30 years. Um, and they do ASR in the Denver Basin Aquifer System, um, the Arapaho Aquifer, some also in the Laramie Fox Hills Aquifer. And I think they're really good examples because um, to a certain degree, it's similar water quality. It's also a similar type of aquifer. You know, it's a bedrock aquifer. It's sandstone. It's not alluvial. Um, loose, unconsolidated sands and gravels and things. And so um, they've been operating ASR wells successfully now for 25 or 30 years. Another example just to the south then is town of Castle Rock. Castle Rock is also doing um, ASR in the Denver Basin. There are a number of other water providers in that south metro area, Parker, Meridian, um, et cetera, that are um, also looking at doing ASR. Denver Water is looking at doing ASR on the Denver Basin. Aurora Water is investigating doing um, ASR in the Denver Basin. Some of the uh, largest sort of best examples also, not a, again, not uh, just, just close to home here, is City of Phoenix. Um, Phoenix is primarily a surface water provider, um, and then they supplement uh, whether it's drought or supplemental supply with groundwater, um, as well as their neighbor to the east, uh, Scottsdale. But they also operate ASR where they take um, surplus surface water uh, supplies, treat them, and then inject them in the aquifer, primarily in the northeastern part of Phoenix. And they've been doing this successfully now for over 10 years and have an award-winning uh, project um, going on that's highly successful in terms of the operations. Um, just there can be many examples. Those are just a couple that, that come to mind. Thanks, Courtney. I'm gonna be mindful of the time and uh, we do have quite a few questions that haven't been answered, but again, we will be sure to post those with responses on our webpage. So I'm gonna go through maybe one more question here and then we will try to wrap things up. Adam, I think, Adam Jokers, I think this might be a question for you. Uh, what balance is the uranium that is in the water? I can take it. Yeah, I think this case, um, uh, the valence state of the uranium, I mean, typically in this sort of system, we would expect the uranium to be in the plus four valence state, and it's going to be in the mobile urinal, uh, uranal ion, which is uh, uranium and oxygen together, uh, that, that mobile ion or cation. So um, that, that's the valence state that we would expect to see it in the groundwater. Thanks, Courtney, and forgive my mispronunciation no, okay. of those terms, I apologize. Again, we have quite a few questions um, that I, I haven't been able to circulate through. Great questions, this has been a great conversation. Um, I wanna be mindful of everyone's time and I'm looking at the number of attendees that have started to, to drop pretty, pretty significantly since we've started. So I suspect some people have things that they need to move on to. So with that, I want to give one final thanks for those of you that joined us. Uh, I know on behalf of the city, the Water and Sewer Board, the City Council, and our leadership that this is an important topic that we are committed to sharing with our community. Uh, Sean, Adam, our Water and Sewer Board, all of our city staff are available. If you have questions, you can find contact information on the Terry Ranch webpage as well. And again, I'll just restate that we are committed to answering your questions. So any of the questions that we weren't able to address uh, tonight during our webinar, we will do some written responses and post that on our Terry Ranch webpage. Uh, with that, I wish you all a good evening and thank you to our panelists for spending time tonight. And attendees, we appreciate your comments and connecting with us on such an important topic for our community. Thank you everyone and have a great evening.